This video is a little different from my others in the sense that I didn't make it. I wanted to do something on David Hockney's approach to photography which, whether one likes it or not, is quite fascinating. I saw this film recently and thought that he's such a, an eloquent and entertaining speaker that I might as well show you the film itself, although I have cut it down a bit to reduce the time. As a very brief introduction, David Hockney of course is probably the most famous and certainly one of the most popular artists on the planet. His exhibitions are always huge media events. One of his main concerns in his work is human vision, how we see and the representation of space, how we experience reality and what we perceive to be reality. Hockney realises the fundamental problem with photography that the camera records the world from a single static point of view one focal length, one perspective, very different from the way we see the world. We have all experienced coming back from off holiday and looking at our photos of the Eiffel Tower or the Great Pyramids or even if it's just a beautiful landscape somewhere and being disappointed because the diminished, limited, one-dimensional image bears no comparison with the grandeur of our original experience. Human beings move through time. A photograph stops time. We move through three-dimensional space and we see the world through two eyes as we flow around and through space. The world changing at every moment and our perception changing at every moment. The camera, on the other hand, freezes space and time. It makes us all see the world the same way, which incidentally explains why so many photographs look as if they were done by the same person. How do we challenge the tyranny of the camera's monocular vision? Hockney's account of these problems and his particular solutions I think are quite brilliant actually. I'm not sure his method can be developed and it might be a bit of a dead end and generally I do like the classical straight documentary photograph. However, Hockney's contribution to the problematics of photography, to the age-old issues of transforming lived experience onto a two-dimensional surface, has to be respected and applauded. So, without further ado, here's the great man himself. Biggest uh, photographic uh, retrospective uh, so far oh, yeah, of your work. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. I kept it all together. You know, mm. it's not seen only in books, but the exhibition's better than the catalogue, mm. isn't it? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes. It should be. It should be. <laughs> Um, the camera, remember, is older than photography. Photography is only the chemical invention of how to put the image on a flat surface uh, with light uh, uh, that reacts to things. It had been used by painters before. Uh, the camera obscura is old. You know, if you make a hole in a box, it projects upside down on a wall that has been known for a long time. The camera wasn't invented in the 19th century, only the chemical process. Uh, the chemical process has changed, but this lens is still the same kind. We're still looking at it. Our cameraman here, you're looking through a hole. You're looking at like a window, at me and so on. I don't connect with you over here. That was what I thought to get involved with taking this void away would be more interesting. Photography crosses a, a border. Um, I think it, it, it's become a collage. Hockney used photographic images and created something that pertained 
more to the condition of, of painting. So I, I am still debating with myself about, you know, is photography an art or is it a fantastic tool? Um, but I think what Hockney did was uh, something different in a way. He, he's not like Cartier-Bresson or Maplethorpe or somebody like that. He, he, he's, uh, he's a painter who's taken a series of images with a camera and rearranged them on a flat surface, and I think that makes it something else. I experimented with photography in a way uh, for about a four or five year period in the 80s. I must tell you, I didn't care whether it was art or not when people criticised me. What are you doing, wasting your time with that stuff, David? Why don't you paint, draw? I didn't really care. I thought, well, I made, uh, made a lot of discoveries, for myself anyway, so I took no notice of that. I began with using a Polaroid camera. Uh, uh, here, you look at it. Uh, the first ones were done in uh, Los Angeles, where I live. Uh, here, though, is one of Phil Brandt. This was uh, English, made in London uh, in uh, May 1982. And Bill Brandt was a famous English photographer, uh, made quite a few memorable images, um, some of the north of England, about when I was born, I do remember that. He came to visit me. I was uh, quite thrilled by this. And I said, could I make a picture of you? And he was quite fascinated as I began to construct it. And I'll point out now that, say, you see one, two, three, four, five sets of hands. But when you look at this, he doesn't look like a monster with ten hands. You are well aware it's one pair of hands seen five times. So we're putting time in it in a different way to this. If you have a Polaroid camera and you begin to do this, you'll realize uh, how close I am to compose that. What are you doing? Do you see my idea about drawing? That line, when I'm composing that, it's very important that that just does that. So you needed a single lens reflex. I'm focusing only on the corner, what's important there. I'm naturally constructing the picture here. He watched me make it. You begin here. I can make the edges wherever I want, like in a painting. In that sense, I have no idea where the edge of this is going to be. Originally, I called these drawing with a camera because I felt the decisions you make seem to be similar here. Uh, here, I put myself then, and a picture even not quite developed, meaning I had shot the Polaroid of the undeveloped Polaroid that freezes the undeveloped <laughs> Polaroid, uh, playing with that. I think the, the joiners, as I believe he calls them, um, are in a way quite amazing. I, I prefer the later ones, the, the Polaroid ones, the grid is too present. When he just makes the kind of collage of the photographs, I think he does things that are quite extraordinary within the world of, of photographs. Um, and he does uh, expand the, the medium in ways that I don't think anybody had ever thought of before. Eventually, I accepted the grid. I accepted the white. I just put them down, accepted it neatly, laid it down. Everyone has equal value in a way. Here, we just began the picture, because actually it's a picture of people looking at a picture who are also looking at something that looks like a picture. Um, I'll tell you, originally, the scene is in Coxwold in Yorkshire. On that day, it happened to be an open day for gardens. 
Uh, you know, busloads of little ladies from York had turned up and you're walking around, it's rather charming. These people, I do not know, they're not posed there. I just am walking past and I see them, and I think, well, what, what are they doing? They're looking at something. They're actually looking at a garden that was open. So I ran back and uh, just took the snap. They're looking, I'm looking at them looking, really. And uh, didn't think much about it. It's just another little photograph I'd taken. And then uh, back in LA, I probably printed it up or printed up another realized it was quite interesting. It's about looking itself. Um, you are looking, they are looking, and you go on back. Um, we then made a bigger one. I made it for Salt's Mill, actually. Uh, it's in the diner there, it's on the wall. I also wanted to test how would the color last and so on. Well, it's lasting very well, the Salt's Mill, actually. And um, I couldn't resist taking another picture of it, and I think this is actually from a 10 by 8 camera. We set up carefully, and uh, I got people to stand in front, including myself. We composed it. I'm stood here in front of a camera. I pointed out if you had another camera at the back, you could step back. It takes you, shows you something else as well. Uh, stepping back reveals more. It has vast implications for us, really, political, all kinds of things. I mean, the moment you step back and see cameras at work, you realize <laughs> this isn't casual. I am performing here in front of it, aren't I, and so on. Uh, I'm well aware how somebody sees this picture, uh, and so on. That's what it's about. Every image is an artifice, essentially, however much you think it's a documentary. It's an artifice, actually. And it led me into areas that were interesting, exciting, a new view of what the camera could do. It opened it out into another way for me. Again, we can see that there's this, been this sort of fight against what he would, I suppose, describe as the, the tyranny of single point perspective. And uh, just as the Cubists wanted to see an object from all sides simultaneously, Hockney's photographs, in, in the most graphic and exceptional way, showed you that. And the thing that is astonishing is that pe people who might recoil in front of a Cubist painting or um, can read those photographs effortlessly. They see exactly what's going on. Um, and uh, it's, uh, it's like a lot of brilliant ideas. They're, they're very simple at root, but it takes that mind to, to see the brilliance in the simplicity. Cubism is an acknowledgement that it's only perceptions of reality that are pictures, not reality. I've always thought this is uh, unfortunately named Cubism. It's not about cubes, really. They were the first pictures that people didn't know what they were. The first pictures that would confuse a viewer. Until then, you always thought you would see, that's a horse, that's a pot. It, seemed you could see it. Cubism, or what it was called, was the first time things, shapes had changed. They looked different. Why? What is this, people would ask. Before you'd really grasped it, another kind of picture had appeared that seemed far more realistic, the moving picture. Um, here is a chair, simple little chair in the Luxembourg Gardens in Paris. I was doing 40 pages for Vogue magazine. This is about 
85. They said it could be about anything. So I thought, oh, I'll, I'd like to point, develop this photography that can be put on a page rather well that acknowledges the page as an edge, even if my photography was trying to expand the edge, you have to accept Vogue magazine can't go on this way and this way, it's just there. So I started moving, acknowledging my movement. Now, here, if you see the, the perspective you think should go that way, that way, not this way. But the moment the reason it goes this way is I'm walking past the chair. I see it this side, then the front, and then that side. If you do it that way, it means you've stood still. In fact, you're not quite there, actually. I began to then discover that perspective is a fascinating subject. Uh, just at the moment, being avoided, it probably has been at other times, but its problems won't go away. They're built into pictures, they're built into depictions. Depiction goes on whether painting does it or not. We want to depict the world, that's why the camera's here, why people have cameras, they want to depict their visions of it, their feelings of it, that's why a lot of amateur photographers, that's why uh, a lot of people want to paint, draw, do it. It's a, deep instinct uh, we have. The reasoning here is uh, to get a whole figure in while you're still quite close. If you've got to know anybody uses a camera will realize uh, if you want the whole figure you have to walk back away from it. That's the nature of lenses and so on. I mean you're only seeing me to here because that's the way the camera is. And I was doing a painting and it, round the corner, all those other portraits, you feel closer to them because I simply am closer, but it means you move down, you see, like that. Uh, uh, and therefore, there's no distortion. Uh, if I'm looking this way, if you pull your camera down, there's distortion happens and so on. So I'm trying to avoid that a bit. And I realize if you do that, it gives us uh, a better thing. He was trying to escape from this tradition of one point perspective established in the Renaissance, where one was a static viewer looking through a frame like a window at an object beyond or at a space beyond. So this didn't entirely satisfy him because although he was playing with that space quite a lot within the rectangle, the overall impression was still that he was subservient to this Renaissance concept of space. And it was at that point that he started using other cameras, a 35 millimeter camera and a compact 110 camera, in order to be able to free himself both from the tyranny of the rectangle and from the tyranny of that one subject matter that had to be within a focal length of a few feet. And then I thought, let's go to the biggest hole I know, which is the Grand Canyon in Arizona, a thrilling space. Most people go and stand on the edge of it and are thrilled looking into it. I seem to think the thrill is from realizing the space, but it's got an edge, a defined edge, so you can see it. After all, you look up and the space is bigger, but we can't comprehend an edge to that. Uh, so the Grand Canyon is probably one of the biggest spaces you can see. It's 10 miles across, at some point you can see 50 miles up it and you're looking into it, you know, not just on a flat surface, you're looking into it.
this created a new set of problems, which is that if you're working with 35 millimeter camera or a compact 110 camera, of course, you don't see the pictures emerging as you make them. With a Polaroid, he, it took a long time. He had to wait 30 seconds or a minute for each photograph to be developed, and then he would take the next one. But he could make the picture in front of him and see what was missing and what he had to add. With a 35 millimeter camera, he had to do it all in his head. He had to remember exactly what he'd photographed already if he was piecing it together from dozens of photographs. And that was a tremendous feat of memory that was involved, of really sharpening his visual memory, which has stood him in incredibly good stead ever since. I'm stood in one place, and they're taken across that way. One, two, three, four, five. So I'm just stood with the cat. This is now, this, we're back now, 1982. Thrilled to think, ah, I found a way to photograph the Grand Canyon and show its grandeur. Never did we make them big, though, till this year. In 1982, I couldn't have made it this big because it would have cost a lot of money that I didn't have then. Uh, to make a photograph that big in 1982, each one would have cost two or three hundred dollars that size. And at that scale, why would I pay out that when I wouldn't, wouldn't know what to do with it? So. I'm not going to do that, you know, so they were just done small. Suddenly the technology has allowed you uh, a great deal cheaper, not that it's totally cheap, but each one now might cost $15, $20 to make instead of $300. So um, it's possible to do it. I had a machine that you can do this with. There's a limitation on the paper. 11 by 17 is the maximum size of paper that you can put in the machine, but the machine will make the pictures bigger. It'll just make it on four sheets of paper. Back to the Polaroid, if we want it bigger, just put a few more there, you see. The process, I think, will last as much as any kind of photograph will. You know, color fades. It's fugitive in pictures like it is in life. I had a rubber stamp made to say that. That's when people ask me, how long does it last? How long do we last? How long does anything last? It's all transient, really. The Chinese, that's why they didn't put shadows there. Everything is a shadow, they think. I like that idea, really. But it's not easy to photograph, as I pointed out. I mean, now, when I watched your rushes, I did realize you couldn't read the Grand Canyon at all, not on the TV screen. And that was partly because, of course, it's printing ink, flat paper, not very physical, and so on. So actually, I went back to LA and realized I had to paint the Grand Canyons to make them work how I wanted. And my immediate reaction was, oh my God, everything is closer to you in real life here. Uh, that's what the photography's done, pushed it all back. I mean, it's unphotographable, actually. I mean, certainly the experience of it is unphotographable because it's a spatial experience. Your eyes have to move in every direction, just as they do at the Grand Canyon and they do at the painting as well. They're doing the same thing. You have to look in every direction. On the way to the Grand Canyon, uh, I'm driving. Anybody who drives knows you can't get back to photograph a steering wheel. You know, how do you, you'd have to get out of the way, get behind yourself and do this. Yet on the way, I'm looking and uh, I realize, ah, here's another subject right in front of me, and I knew, figured out how to do it. Normally, the camera, you, anybody who drives a car has a camera, how do you do it? So I then picked other things that are close. I go to the dentist, uh, dentists come in on you, and 
He's a friend of mine, this dentist in Hollywood. Hollywood has the best dentists. I have bad teeth, but you know, for movies, they want the good teeth and everything. Uh, I'm not, I don't have that kind of vanity in myself. I have another kind, but... So anyway, I go to the dentist. You can see, here's the feet in the chair. Uh, I know it looks like Dr. Frankenstein <laughs> or something. Uh, Merle hated it. In fact, it was just put away. This is probably the first time it was exhibited. Um, here's something where the camera normally couldn't get that close. The camera, in a sense, is becoming my body. It's taking my place. It's a bit difficult to grasp that idea, but it is possible, like the eyes, the camera can be an eye. It was a complicated process because there was, first of all, finding an appropriate subject, then taking all those photographs, which took a certain amount of time, even with a 35 millimeter camera, even with a quick camera, um, and then waiting for them to come back and then having to remake the picture as a collage. And there were still a lot of decisions to be made from those prints that came back. I was trying to show movement. We took the photographs, I sent them down to the photo map in Hollywood, and he didn't do them right. He, normally, they, they're pretty good. Um, two of the films, all here, were destroyed. And at first, I thought, oh, what a, you know, you get mad. And then there's a little note from Tom. Dear Mr. Hockney, I'm very sorry about the two rolls of film. It was an accident. We thought we had pushed the button. I, I look at the note and think, well, what am I going to do? It's ruined. But I thought, well, no, I might as well put the note. That's a part of it. That's what happened. Why not use the accident? Uh, so I we photographed the note as well for another one. Uh, and so it's part of it. So, well, use whatever happens, use the accident. I was also in Yorkshire taking photographs. So I just bought a little camera in Bridlington. I sent them to Boots, the chemist. They kept saying to me, is there a lot of stuff to photograph in Bridlington? I said, no, nah, more than you think, you know. Again, they think it's just out there. It's not. The beauty is in the process of seeing, I know that. So um, I put it together in a different way. That is maybe an hour of looking. Uh, here is actually two months. Uh, I'm looking rather more carefully at a landscape in a different way, a landscape that I've known since my childhood here. And it's a an agricultural landscape, meaning the surface of the earth is altered constantly. And I observed that over two months, different surfaces. I gave it the title, Husbandry in the East Riding. Uh, I knew the word husbandry is, what, medieval English from the Bible. My assistant, Richard, what is this? What do you mean, husbandry? I said, well, it means uh, agriculture, looking after surface, animals, uh, husbanding. It's a medieval world. Look it up. He looked it up and liked it. I think it's quite a, a revolutionary thing that he did there. Um, and I think you can also see how, in his painting, he's trying to do the same sort of thing, but it's, it's, it's different because he's actually applying pigment to canvas but he's trying to get movement and timelessness and multiple points of view and, and defeat the tyranny of the, of the two-dimensional plane. I'd keep stopping exploring with the camera, going back to painting and, uh, or the theatre. Uh, and uh, I, I discovered Chinese scrolls, which are quite a different way of making a picture. And, of course, they're not known because they can't be reproduced in a book. Even the book pay 
page turns over on itself and these unravel. In the opposite way, this is going that way, these went that way. Um, this is a roll as well, isn't it? But it's that way. And I, of course, started trying to develop it in painting. This was called A Visit to Christopher and Don, a friend of mine in California, whose house I went to a lot, and they lived on the edge of Santa Monica Canyon. That's, you know, a V like this, and their house was here, and on the edge of it was a house that's not there anymore. The last earthquake, it fell into the sea, and, uh, but that was the point. You came down a road, uh, and 145 Adelaide Drive, that's where it was, cars parked, and then you descended a staircase into the living room. That house you saw through the living room as well. Don's studio upstairs and downstairs, you are always seeing this house. It's not different houses, it's the same house, seen from different rooms. Uh, you then walk through, uh, you see it again, the dining area, you're seeing it again, um, you're seeing it again, here's, you're walking past the television set. The perspective is therefore that way. If it went that way, you'd have stopped. Uh, it, your eye would stop, I found also if you had a horizontal and a vertical, the eye stops. You had to keep it flowing. Again, here's Christopher in his study typing. Uh, the house is seen yet again through his window. You were always looking out at it. And it took me quite a while to construct it. And then when I explained it, you begin to see it, and uh, uh, it came out of those other photographs. Do you see? Los Angeles is, in a way, a very ugly city, and Los Angelinos, in my experience, are always apologizing uh, for their city and say, oh, have you been to San Francisco? Um, it's so much nicer. Uh, but, of course, for non-Los uh, Angeles denizens, the, the city does have a an amazing appeal because it's so familiar and so much of so much movie history has taken place there. So even some grubby diner in a back street has a, a certain allure. Um, and Hockney, I suppose, took more of the suburban myths of the the plate glass cabana and the and the everybody with their own swimming pool and and used them for his for his own artistic ends. But of course, they're commonplace in California, and it took. Maybe that eye from cold, bleak north of England to see how you know wonderfully alluring they were. I then went back to photography, I was asked by Vanity Fair, was it, I think, American magazine, to illustrate a story by a writer I knew about searching for Lolita again in the southwestern United States. It was about driving in the desert, in the open spaces. I think they really wanted me to do Lolita, but somehow I responded to the driving. As you drive in California a lot, driving around, you see things in a bit of a different way. You're seeing it through time, speed, memory, how, what did I see back there, and so on. So I find a subject out on Pear Blossom Highway, just over the mountains from Los Angeles, over the San Gabriel Mountains, I find an area and think, I'm now going to try and depict this space. I'd already realized I needed a ladder. 
It took about seven days to photograph. This one I did, had to construct out in the desert because I couldn't ever remember what to do. Although it looks like an ordinary picture at first, Quickly, you begin to realize it isn't. There's, you are actually moving about in it. I'll point out why you needed a ladder to do it. You see, the stop sign, if you look at that bit, I'm right in front of it. If I was down on the ground looking up, it would be doing that. I had the ladder to be right in front of it. I'm out there in the desert, up a ladder, Eventually, we find a helicopter coming over, kind of police or something, thinking, what's that guy doing? You know, I realize how ridiculous he must look. I'm up a ladder photographing a stop sign, the Pear Blossom Highway sign. You realize you're right next to these things. You can actually read the lettering here. I am moving all over. Here, I'm over there. To do the lettering on the road, I'm again up the ladder looking down. It looks as though it's from one point out here, but you quickly realize it isn't, it can't be. You know, everybody likes to take photographs. It's a very accessible medium in a way. And the moment people see, well, yes, you can show the world a bit bigger. I think people could take it now further. I mean, somebody can start and realize what it does. I, mean, I walked through the exhibition with nobody here. And uh, when I got in here, I also realized um, the journey was to a kind of silence. Uh, there's a visual silence here, and also that's happening to me in the sense I'm losing my hearing, which is why I talk all the time. It stops, you know, you don't have to listen if you talk. It occurred to me that that might also be a subject here, in a way, Silence is not a visual thing, in a, and we think, but it occurred to me, and I liked it being here on my own, I must admit. Uh, each one of those is one person looking at a quiet place. This too is a quiet place. Uh, that's it. That's, uh, I'll have to have a drink of water and I'm finished. Thank you.